148, Part 2, Chapter 3. A popular song for the fifty suggests that love makes the world go round, but our confidence would probably be better, bet. Rufus Dubon was staying in the night in the room 4414, up near the elevators, was a salesman from the swinging, swinger, swinging, singing, Singer Sewing Machine Company in town for Texas to talk about moving up to executive position. So it happened the ninety or so years after the room. Fourteen or eight's first occupant jumped to his death. Another sewing machine salesman saved the life of the man who came to write about a protively haunted room. Perhaps that is exaggeration. Might as well might have lived. Even if he hit no one, especially a fellow who way back from a visit to an ice machine, been in the hallway at that moment. Having your shirt caught fire is no joke, though. He certainly would have been burned much more severely and instantly. If it had not been for Dearborn, you have thought fast and moved even faster. Not that Dearborn had ever remembered exactly what happened. Constructed corridor enough story for newspapers and TV cameras. He liked the idea of being a hero very much. It certainly did not harm his executive reparations. He clearly remembers seeing a man on the fire lunge out to the hall. But after that, everything that everything was a blur. Think about it. It's like trying to construct the things you had done during the vilest, deepest drunk of your life. One thing you're sure of, he didn't tell any of the reporters because it made no sense. The Burning Man scream seemed to grow in volume as if it was a stereo being turned up. You're right there in front of Dave Bong. The picture the scream never changed, but the volume most certainly did. It was just as if the man had been had some incredibly loud object that was just arriving there. Here. Dear Bong ran down the hall, a fill ice bucket in his hand. But a man, it was just his shirt on fire. I saw the rat right away, he told the reporter, struck the door. Struck the door opposite the room. He came out rebounded, staggered and fell to his knees. And when Dear Bong reached him, put his foot on the burning shoulder of the screaming man's shirt and pushed him over to the carpet, cool carpet. He dumped the contents of ice bucket onto him. These things are blurred in his memory, accessible. He was too uh, was aware the burning shirt seemed to be casting far too much light. A sweltering yellow orange light made him think of a trip he and his brother made to Australia two years before. He rented an ill will drive and taken off across the great Australian desert. A few natives called it the great Australian bugger all. The dear bone brothers discovered A hell of a trip, great but spooky, especially the big rock in the middle, edge rock. When they reached it right around sunset, the light on its men's faces was like this, hot and strange, but really, what you thought as an earth light at all? He dropped beside the bunny man who was now a smothering man, a covered with ice cubes man, and rolled in with his stifle, the flames reaching around the back shirt. When he did... He saw the smoke on the left skin, the left side of the man's neck, gone a smoky, bl- bloody, bubbly red. A lobe of his ear on that side had melted a little. But otherwise, otherwise. Dearborn looked up and seemed that this was crazy. He seemed the door to the loam. A man had come out was filled with burning light of Australian sunlight down. Hot like an empty place where things a man never seen might live. It was terrible, that light, the low, buzzing little light. Electric clipper that was trying desperately to speak. But he was fascinated too. He wanted to get in and go on to it. He wanted to see what was behind it. Perhaps Mike saved Bobo's life as well. He's certainly aware Theobald was getting up to. Getting up as Mike no longer held any interest in for him. Her face was filled with the blazing, pulsing light coming out of 1408. He remembered this better than Dibbon later than himself, but of course Rafe Bilbon had been reduced to setting himself on fire in order to survive. Mike grabbed the cuff of Dibbon's slacks. Don't go in here, he said in a cracked, smoky voice. you never come out. Dibbon stopped, looking down the reddening, bursting face of a man on the carpet. It's haunted, Mike said, as if the words had been men. the door of room 48. 148 slammed for as he shut, cutting off the light, cutting off the terrible buzz that was almost words. Rafael Stibon, one of the swimming singers, 
machines finally ran down into the elevators and pulled up the fire alarm. Chapter 4 There's an interesting picture of Mike Esling entreating the burn victim dying as it approached. A 16th edition which appeared about 16 months of Mike's short stay in a room 408. The Hotel de Vin. But it shows just his torso. But it is Mike, all right. But I can tell by the white square on the left side of his chest. The flesh all around it is angry red. Actually blistered and second degree burns in some places. A white square marks the left breath pocket of his shirt. He's wearing the night. A lucky shirt with his microcorder in the pocket. Microcorder itself melted around the corners. But still works and my tape inside was fine. It's one of those things on which that were not fine. It's the things on it which are not fine. Listening it for three or four times, Mike's agent, Savarel, so tossed it into the wall safe, refusing the knowledge of goose flesh all in his tan, all over his tan, scrawny arms. The wall safe, the tape has stayed ever since. For no, no, no urge to take it out and play it again. Not for himself, not for his curious friends, some of whom would cheerfully kill to hear it. New York Publishing is a small community, word gets around. He doesn't like Mike's voice on the tape. He doesn't like his stuff that like the voice is saying. My brother's eaten a wolf in one winter, Connecticut Turnpike. What in God's name is that supposed to mean? Most of all, he doesn't like the background sounds. The tape are kind of liquid, squashing. It sometimes sounds like clothes churning around, the over-sudded washer. Sometimes like the old, those old electric hair clippers. Sometimes really like a voice. Oh, Mike was still in the hotel, hospital. A man called her in, a manager of the goddamn hotel. If you please come, came and asked somewhere if he could listen to the tape. Well, I said no, he couldn't. Owen could could do the tape himself on out of the agent's office. A rapid hike, and thank God, all the way back to the flea bag, where he worked in the hotel that, that make Edlin. Edlin had decided not to sue. Even the hotel owing for the negligence. Would I trade him out not to go in? I tried to trade him not to go in, Owen said quietly. Man has spent most of his working days listening to tired travellers and prevalent, petulant guests bitch about everything from their rooms to the magazine selection and the newsstand. He wasn't much perturbed by Freire's tour. I tried everything in my power if anyone. Is a legend that night, Miss Frail, which is your client. You behave too much in nothing, bleeding too much in nothing. Very unwise behaviour, very unsafe behaviour. Well, I guess he has changed somewhat in that regard. By Frail's distaste for the tape, Could, would like Mike to listen to it, acknowledge it, perhaps use it as a pad from which to launch his own book. There is a book in what happened to Mike Frail. Knows it. Not just a chapter, forty page case history, tie book, one that might outsell all three of the night ten night box combined. And but of course he wouldn't he doesn't believe Mike, Mike's assertion. He had finished not only with ghost tales, but all writing. But I just say that from time to time that's all. Occasional done of him dumb outbursts. Part of what makes writers in, writers in the first place. As far as in himself, he got off lucky, or things considered, he knows it, should have been burned much more badly than he actually was. If not for Mr. Dibble, his bucket of ice, he might have had 20 of even 30 different gra- skin graft procedures, so far through, instead of only four. His neck is scarred on the left side of spiked the grafts, but Dr. the Boston Burn you should tell him he scars. And the scares will fade away on their own. He also knows that burns painful as they were in weeks and months of the night were necessary. They are not for the matches or close covered before striking, right on the front. He would have he would have died in fourteen oh eight. The end would have been unspeakable. His end would have been unspeakable. The coroner might have looked like a stroke or heart attack. The actual cause of death would have been much nastier. Much nastier. He's also lucky he reduced three popular books the ghosts and haunted book old things for actually running afoul of the place it's haunted this he knows also knows but Sam Morrell may not believe Mike's life as a writer is over but Sam doesn't need to Mike knows it f- for both of them he's got so much writer of postcard about feeling gold with his skin and being nauseated deep pit of his belly so I think just looking sometimes just looking at a pen or a tape recorder or make him think 
pictures of crooked. I tried to straighten the, the pictures. Didn't know what it means. D- d- can't remember the pictures or anything else from room 148. And he's glad. That is a mercy. His blood pressure isn't good these days. Doctor told him it burned victims or there any problems with their blood pressure and put him in on medication. He double tried him. I troubled him. The orthologist told him to start taking octavates. He was for consistent black problems. His prostate was gotten too large. He could deal with these things. He knows it isn't the first person to escape. One for eight. Without actually escaping, Owen tried to tell him it isn't all bad. At least he didn't, doesn't remember. Sometimes he has a nightmare. Often, quite often, in fact, almost very goddamn, every goddamn nightmare fact. But he really remembers them when he wakes up. Sense that things are rounding off the corners. Mostly melting away of corners. His miracle recorder melted. He lives on an island these days. When the weather is good, he makes long, takes long walks on the beach. Close as ever came to articulating. He well, does remember that he's 70 odd, very odd minutes in 1408 was on those walks. He was never human, he told the incoming waves, a choked, haunting voice. Ghosts, at least ghosts, were once human. A thing in the wall, though, that thing. Time may improve it. He can, he can and does hope for that. Time may fade it, as we all fade the scars in neck in the meantime. For he sleeps and lights on his bedroom, so he will know at once when he wakes up from the b- bad dreams. He has had all the phones taken out of the house at some point, just from the place his conscious mind seems able to go, afraid of picking up the phone and hearing a buzzing, inhuman voice spit. This is nine, nine, we have killed your friends. Every friend is now dead. And when the sun goes up, Goes down on clear evenings. Pulls down every shade and blind the drape of the house. He sits like a man in a dark room. Till his watch tells him, light, even the last fading glow, long horizon must be gone. He can't stand the light, and then goes that comes at sunlight. Sunset, that yellow deepening to orange, like light in the Australian desert.